Hi everyone, thanks for joining me. I'm excited to talk to you today about universally connected smart contracts, the important role they have to play in how financial institutions are going to evolve in their use of infrastructure, what that means for their users, and how blockchain startups and decentralized financial products are gonna be making their way much more into our daily lives and to how the financial industry functions. Uh, I think really that's uh, maybe the first meaningful point is that we're really now at an inflection point, in my opinion, of the adoption for the next generation of smart contracts. That's, that next generation is called decentralized finance. Centralized finance is basically the use of blockchains for the creation of financial products rather than just tokens, right? So traditionally, blockchains have really been used to make tokens and to move those tokens between different private keys and different owners. And now what you're seeing is that the underlying infrastructure that is available to developers to create financial products in a decentralized uh, blockchain-based format is finally reaching the levels where they can build those applications. And the building of those applications is, is naturally leading to their consumption. So the, the really initial point is that there, there is a large inflection point and really a redefinition in our industry from an industry that's mainly about tokens to start and the generation of tokens, which, which was the ICO boom and uh, a lot of different tokens being generated, which, which was a good evolution for the space because it seeded a lot of value onto blockchains that could then be turned into financial products. But I think it's, it, it is now time and I'm, we're seeing now in, 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 the, in terms of user adoption that there's a shift more towards the creation of financial products. And in my opinion, there are so many more financial products that could be, can be created that the space will really become redefined by financial products, just like the token boom redefined the space when that happened. Th this is really kind of the, the evolution that, that I've seen that I think is useful from a historical point of view. You initially saw Bitcoin multi-signature as the first real smart contract where you could sign a transaction for multiple signers with, with their respective private keys. You then saw the appearance of protocol smart contracts that had people write a contract into an actual protocol. And this is when I really started spending most of my time building smart contracts about seven years ago, when you, when you really started to be able to build any kind of smart contract that wasn't just about um, multi-signature or something else. The problem was that you, you had to take months or sometimes over a year to get a smart contract working because you actually had to change the blockchain that was running it, the protocol, to get it to, to operate, to get your smart contract to operate. So it was an unbelievably difficult process, very few people did it, and it really slowed the industry down. We then saw a transition to what are often called scriptable smart contracts, and Ethereum deserves a lot of credit for this. Ethereum basically led the evolution of our space away from protocol smart contracts, where you took months or even over a year to generate a new smart contract, into being able to generate contracts, uh, smart contracts in the, in, in the span of a month or weeks. And this was because you could write them up and you could put them in a VM and they would run in a, in a, in a decentralized computational infrastructure. The, the limitation there, that was a huge improvement, but the limitation there was you could mainly write them about tokens and voting, often voting in relation to tokens. And this was what people could do. And so this is what people did. They generated a lot of tokens and that led to the token and the ICO boom, which, which was a step forward for the space. Now what I think we're seeing is the transition or, or not the transition, but the evolution of smart contracts into something that can make tokens and can do some kind of voting for private keys, but can also interact with external systems to create financial products. Because when you actually look at the financial products that exist out in the world, whether they're lending products or derivatives products, you, you see that they do need to interact with external data. They do need connectivity with other systems in order to know what's going on in the market, in order to be written about uh, financial in, you know, outcomes in the market. So this is, this is really what universally connected smart contracts are about. And I think the important nuance to, to kind of understand is that you can't actually build a smart contract that's connected to the external world using just a blockchain. So just a blockchain can't connect to APIs, can't connect to data feeds. And this is by design. And it's, on, it's instantiated because the, the, the blockchains and the smart contracts that operate within them want a certain level of security and reliability and guarantees about how tamper-proof they actually are, which is their unique property, right? So the unique property of these smart contracts is that they're highly reliable and tamper-proof, 
and that's achieved partly by limiting access to external systems. And so you, you, you want that unique property of being tamper-proof and highly reliable and decentralized, but you get this huge limitation of being unable to connect with external systems. The, this is the, the limitation that we solve. So this is, this is the Oracle problem and, and the solution is a decentralized Oracle mechanism, which is the, essentially the application of decentralized computation and multiple different node operators, validating external data, creating an Oracle mechanism that provides guarantees similar to the smart contract itself. So that you previously had only an on-chain portion of the contract and that's all you had to rely on. But now because you have to rely on off-chain portions, you have to rely on external data, enterprise systems, various other systems, you, you basically need uh, a, a secure middleware that can enable those interactions at a very high level of validation and security in order to maintain the unique guarantees of a smart contract. And that's what an Oracle does, and that's what we do in the form of a decentralized Oracle mechanism called Chainlink. We do this in a blockchain agnostic way, so we allow you to interact with many different chains. We have over 50 chains announced, many integrating, many going live, um, many already working, and, and we kind of enable the interaction with these blockchains from both bank backends and various data sources. So what, what a secure blockchain middleware like Chainlink does is it enables the proper interaction of important contract inputs and outputs, whether those are existing internal systems, market data sources, together with blockchains and smart contracts. And, and that's really what, uh, what we specialize in and what we feel has actually been enabling the continued growth of DeFi. So even, even on this chart, you can see two of these uh, users, uh, Synthetix and Aave, uh, both of our users contributing right now at this moment over a billion dollars in value to, to this calculation. And many of our other users can, can contributing more as well. So you, you basically see that the growth in DeFi is driven by the ability for people to build both a smart contract on a blockchain and the use of an Oracle mechanism to power that smart contract with external connectivity that meets the extreme validation and reliability guarantees. So I, I think the most, the, the first significant thing to talk about is the inflection point uh, that we're at right now with decentralized financial products, and that this is something that both banks and fintechs should really be mindful of because it, it's, it's on its way to becoming the preferred form in which many users want to interact with their financial products. The other development that I think is of, of, of great significance is that the, the token boom and the existence of tokens and the, the, the life cycle of, of how tokens are being adopted is I think now finally arriving at a place where banks and the larger global financial system are seeing value in things like custody. So you're starting to see banks now wholesale going in to generating basically crypto token ownership, financial products, custody products, interactions with, with crypto firms. And, and this is something that's going to massively accelerate in, in the near term and the medium term. And, and so the story of there was a token boom that made certain types of ownership or, 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 or certain types of financial ownership valuable. Initially, people didn't believe it would be adopted and banks had, you know, had not wanted nothing to do with it. And now you're seeing the best banks and many other banks very quickly moving towards generating custody and token ownership solutions. And, and really this story is going to bring banks into this, this kind of initial dynamic is going to bring banks into the blockchain sphere, but then the same story is going to happen with financial products. So even if banks right now might say, no, financial products, you know, we make them our traditional way and it's fine. It's, it's going to be the same exact dynamic where the financial products become in demand become adopted, people start asking for them, and banks are once again in a position where they, they, they need to deliver what their users ask for, right? Because that's why their users are their users. So, so these two significant dimensions of, you're starting to see an inflection point uh, that you saw similarly to the ICO and token boom, you're start, starting to see it with decentralized financial products and their adoption. And the digital banks and, and, the, and the other larger banks that can see this for what it is, and the fintechs that can see it for what it is, I think are starting to very seriously think about how do I make financial products that will be attractive in this future blockchain kind of based blockchain powered world. The, the dynamics around how they can participate in, in a blockchain based world 
really revolve around whether they want to provide access to existing decentralized financial products, whether they want to make their own decentralized financial products, or whether they want to provide services to people who make decentralized financial products as, as a bank that can provide data or other services. So I, I think the first meaningful way that many banks can interact with decentralized financial uh, smart contracts is by enabling their users to access them, to utilize them, to take their funds and basically put them into these decentralized financial products. And that is the simplest immediate way to, to do that. And this is a dimension where something like Chainlink's blockchain middleware is quite useful because all the different blockchains where the different financial products will come into existence are accessible through our middleware. So banks don't need to generate uh, a bunch of integrations themselves. They don't need to make 15 uh, integration teams for the 15 blockchains where they all might want to you know, have access to decentralized financial products because maybe they want decentralized financial products from different geographies that represent different assets and, and so on. And so the, 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 the first dynamic that's very simple is just like you as a bank might offer custody of crypto, why not also move towards offering access to decentralized financial products? And, and that's something that blockchain middleware has a role in, but also many of the DeFi protocols are, are, are accelerating the way to do that as well. The, the second dynamic is around the actual creation of an on-chain financial product by a bank. Now, this is very exciting, and this is where banks can really take a lot of their competence for making financial products and put it to work. Uh, I don't see enough banks doing this now, but I think just like banks became comfortable with generating on-chain um, custody, right, by generating custody solutions where they would offer their users some manner of holding tokens for them, which was an unheard of idea years ago for many, many banks, right? And many, many people said it wasn't going to happen. And, and now it's happening. Now you're seeing a huge influx of both the national banks and all other banks uh, starting to seriously look at how do I provide custody of crypto to my users, right? And I, I think the same dynamic will happen for on-chain financial products coming from banks. And there will once again be a few leaders that excel at that and are able to reap a large amount of rewards. In this scenario, you're also going to need middleware to basically interact with that on-chain financial product, feed it data, feed it commands, uh, in many cases, know what's going on with the on-chain financial product. And this is another dimension of what the, the blockchain middleware, that uh, the secure blockchain middleware that Chainlink provides is, is something that we excel at. So this is, this is the second way that I think banks and fintechs can can think of how do I make a financial product that's gonna be on chain? And then you're gonna have a question about how do I efficiently interact with all the many on chain environments that I need to interact with? And that's where blockchain middleware can be useful for both triggering the contract securely and even allowing your existing systems to interact with, with, uh, with those financial products. The growth that, uh, that I think is to come is, is going to accelerate this. So I, I think there, there is a much larger hop from I'm not going to deal with crypto at all, I'm not going to have custody of any tokens at all, to I'm going to have custody of tokens, and I'm going to make financial products about those tokens. Right? So I, I think the, the really big hop that needs to happen, and that is happening right now, is that banks are thinking about how do I do custody of crypto? And once they have that set up, and once they're comfortable with that, the transition into financial products around crypto, maybe even for many of the large uh, and growing DeFi protocols that exist out there is, is a natural step, right? And that's a very exciting step that I think will allow the larger market-wide adoption of all these banks' users to come into using blockchain and, and, and crypto products. And, and I, I do think there is a lot of demand there from users and that demand will actually grow as the guarantees that crypto systems and blockchains and decentralized financial smart contracts provide um, and as those guarantees become more clear to users because those guarantees are truly unique and extremely valuable. The, the final way that I think banks can participate basically in, 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 in the smart contract revolution and, and blockchains and, and how they're going to reinvent the, the global financial system is by the providing of various data the providing of various services to these financial products. Banks have um, access to all kinds of Forex data, various data resources that they generate, that they, that they can provide, uh, various other services that banks can provide. 
And it's really the providing of these services to DeFi products uh, that is something that I that banks are in a unique position to provide, just like they provide those services to web application companies that need a banking partner, that need certain data from banks, that want to have certain interactions with banks because they're the institutions and entities that can properly interact with certain parts of the financial system. And I, I think this is another great opportunity that's very deeply enabled by blockchain middleware because you, you basically need blockchain middleware to provide data to, to all these smart contract networks. And you, you, you definitely want to provide uh, this resource and this data to a multitude of environments, right? So you, 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 you don't really have as much of a benefit of just saying, I'm going to put data on one blockchain, or I'm going to provide a service to a single chain somewhere, whether it's a private or a public variant. You're, you're really much better off having a middleware solution that future-proofs you against all the chains that you want to put things on, right? So if you become future-proof, you're able to put data onto all the environments where people might need that data. And therefore the effort you put in to making a product and making your services available to, to blockchains is, is, is worth much more because you have a much larger market consuming it. I'm, I'm actually quite thrilled to, to announce and put forward that we have already been working with great partners like Center Prime and many of the top banks in Korea like HANA Bank, IBK Bank, NH Bank, and Shinhan Bank with the help of Center Prime. In, in, in the creation of a uh, Korean won reference data feed for decentralized financial products. So our, our system actually specializes in the creation of highly reliable data sets from multiple independent data sources. And for the, those data sets to be consumable and consumed by many different uh, centralized financial products and blockchain networks, right? And we're, we're really thrilled that not only Center Prime, but also many of the banks that, the, that, that we're collaborating with are able to feed in their Forex data to provide a, a very reliable, high quality Korean won reference data resource for the decentralized financial community in Korea. And I think this is, this is a pattern of what's to come is that you can really see how many different banks that generate Korean, uh, either Korean won price data or, or any other data are gonna find themselves in a position where it's, it's very easy and actually th there's premiums paid for, for them to provide their data and their other regulated and high quality services to smart contracts through something like Chainlink. I'm, I'm also glad to say that we already have uh, certain users lined up for using this data in Korea, in the Korean market, things like the public cloud crypto, cryptocurrency wallet from Always Fun and, uh, and a number of other folks that, that we're chatting with about how do we properly use um, this data in the decentralized financial markets of Korea? And so I, I think that this is really a picture of what's to come. You're gonna see various banks look at how do I properly interact with blockchains? Do I offer decentralized financial products to my users, just like I'm thinking of offering crypto custody to them? Do I generate my own decentralized financial products for users to consume? And do I, you know, do I seek to compete in that market or do I provide services, whether that's data or other services to decentralized financial product teams, the same way that I provide those services to web, uh, web companies and merchants and others that want to use my bank as uh, basically a set of services that gives them, you know, financial capabilities that they wouldn't have otherwise. And it's, it's, it's really this evolution that I think is, is what's gonna co go on to define how different geographies evolve. It's, it's gonna be both the decentralized financial protocols, it's gonna be the teams making the decentralized financial products on those protocols and making them uh, accessible and usable, and it's gonna be how uh, digital banks, national banks, fintechs come together to both provide services to decentralized financial products, maybe create some of those decentralized financial products, and, and kind of bring a lot of that stuff more into the mainstream through uh, making it available to their users, just like they make crypto uh, available, will, will soon make crypto available to the users through custody of tokens, which once again was an uncommon idea even only a few years ago, but now is becoming more and more common and more and more obvious. And I, I think the same dynamic is, is going to take hold for decentralized financial products and banks interaction with them either as someone that sells them, someone that makes them, or somebody that provides services to those decentralized financial products. 
So I, I hope this has been interesting and helpful. Thank you uh, for coming to the presentation. Have, uh, have a great day. Thank you.